Good morning. My name is Nisha Dale, and on behalf of Christ Commission Fellowship in San Francisco, we'd like to give you our warm welcome, and we'd like you to know that we are blessed that you are spending this time with us. We'd like you to know that this online service is available on demand at our YouTube channel and Facebook page. You can even tag or share this worship video with your friends and families wherever they are in the world. We believe that engaging people with our church goes beyond our church walls and that this is why we are passionate about connecting people all over the world for one unified purpose. Sharing the love of Jesus Christ and making Christ committed followers who will make Christ committed followers. Whether you have ever attended CCF in San Francisco in the past or visiting us for the first time, we want to extend an invitation to you to be part of this community. So hit the chat button below, tell us where you're worshiping from, greet someone or just say hi. Drop us a note via text or email through the different platforms you see on the screen and we'd be more than happy to tell you more about us and our different ministries. Today, if you are catching us in our morning service, we are going to hear Pastor Peter Tanchi to minister to us in the Word. However, if you are watching us this afternoon, Pastor Bong Saking will be delivering the message in our Filipino service. Now, before anything else, let me ask you this question. With all that's going on in the world today, it's no wonder many of us live in fear, trapped in our own anxieties and what-ifs. How can we find the courage to overcome our greatest fears and live fearlessly? Join us as we continue our study on 1 Peter in our new series, Fearless. Let's learn together from God's wonderful Word. But before we get to our Sunday message, let's have our worship team lead us with songs of praise. the Lord has made. So come, let us rejoice and be glad in it. Let us worship our God, who is the name above all names and worthy of all our praise. Let's sing together.
Today's message is based on 1 Peter 3, 13-22. Who is there to harm you if you prove zealous for what is good? But even if you should suffer for the sake of righteousness, you are blessed. And do not fear their intimidation, and do not be troubled, but sanctify Christ as Lord in your hearts, always being ready to make a defense to everyone who asks you to give an account for the hope that is in you, yet with gentleness and reverence. And keep a good conscience, so that in the thing in which you are slandered, those who revile your good behavior in Christ will be put to shame. For it is better, if God should will it so, that you suffer for doing what is right, rather than for doing what is wrong. For Christ also died for sins once for all, the just for the unjust, so that He might bring us to God. Having been put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the Spirit, in which also He went and made proclamation to the spirits now in prison, who once were disobedient, when the patience of God kept waiting in the days of Noah, during the construction of the ark, in which a few, that is eight persons, were brought safely through the water. Corresponding to that, baptism now saves you, not the removal of dirt from the flesh, but an appeal to God for a good conscience through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who is at the right hand of God, having gone into heaven after angels and authorities and powers had been subjected to Him. Greetings in the wonderful name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Let me begin by asking you a question. What do you think is the prevalent emotion that's going on today, especially during this time of lockdown pandemic? Can you guess? Is it sadness? Is it anger? Is it loneliness or is it fear, worry? That's right. The most common negative emotion is fear. The fear of what may happen. There is financial fear, fear of your job, fear of what will happen to your loved ones, your health. And the root problem is really the fear of dying, death. So how do we overcome fear? Let's look at 1 Peter chapter 3 as we continue our series. What is the title for today? Living Hope Overcomes Fear. Once upon a time, Peter was overwhelmed with fear. Do you remember? He was afraid of a servant girl when he was asked, are you not with Jesus? And how many times did Peter deny Jesus? Out of fear. And by the grace of God, this man who was full of fear was transformed. What happened to him? Let us learn from the Apostle Peter how to overcome fear. Let's begin by reading 1 Peter chapter 3. As we continue our series, 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 13 down. Who is there to harm you if you prove zealous for what is good? But even if you should suffer for the sake of righteousness, you are blessed. And do not fear their intimidation and do not be troubled. In these two verses, you will notice Peter gives them a command. He says, do not fear. Don't be afraid. Don't fear their intimidation and do not be troubled. This is a quotation from Isaiah chapter 8, where God says, do not be afraid of men. Don't be afraid of what people can do to you. In fact, in these two verses, he's saying, if you do what God wants you to do, you have nothing to fear. Can you imagine our Lord and Savior, our God, is telling us, do not be afraid. The command, do not be afraid, is repeated over 365 times 
Because God wants you to know His heart. He's saying, don't be afraid. In fact, in Matthew chapter 6, 31 to 34, Jesus tells us, do not worry. You see, fear, anxiety, worry, they are all interrelated. You begin by worrying. You begin to be anxious. And later on, you become fearful. He tells us, do not worry. What do you worry about today? Most of us, what do we worry? Do not worry. What we will eat, what we will drink, or what we will wear. These are things that are basic. That's what we worry about. Wow. Jesus tells us, don't worry. Your heavenly Father knows you need all of these things. Notice, He tells us, don't worry. Your Father, God knows. But seek first His kingdom and His righteousness, and all of these things will be added to you. Do not worry about tomorrow. Do you notice? Jesus tells us, how do you overcome worry? How do you overcome fear? Put Him first. Seek first His kingdom and His righteousness. Live a Christ-centered life. And then He tells you, don't worry about tomorrow. The truth is most of us worry. A study was made about what people worry about. Majority of the times, we worry about tomorrow. We worry about the future. The truth is, what you worry about, what will happen in the future, they don't happen. And God is saying, you can live a life that is not fearful. And that is God's legacy for His people. So He tells us, according to the Apostle Peter, three principles to overcome fear. Live a Christ-centered life a clear conscience, and confident in Christ. Let me explain to you. What does it mean to live a Christ-centered life? But sanctify Christ as Lord in your hearts. The word sanctify Christ, that's the word from holy, hagiatso. This is a command. Peter is saying, sanctify Christ, set apart Christ. As Lord. For many of us, we think of Jesus as our Savior. But if you look at the New Testament, the words describing Jesus are as follows 700 times, Jesus is described as Lord, capital L. He is the Lord, the King of Kings, the absolute sovereign, the creator, the almighty. The all-powerful, the one that has all authority, that is Jesus. Sanctify Christ as Lord in your hearts. It has to be in your hearts. In other words, in our heart, there is really only one throne. Who will be seated on the throne? Who will be the most important person in your life or in your heart? And Peter is saying, set apart, sanctify Christ. As Lord. Let me ask you a question. Do you really know why you believe what you believe? How do you really know that Christ is Lord in your heart? How can you tell? In Luke 6 46, Jesus tells us, Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do what I say? In other words, if we call Jesus as Lord, if we sanctify Jesus, if Christ is center, He is Lord, the evidence is obedience. Now, let me ask you an honest question. Is Jesus Lord in your heart? Do you really obey Him? I don't know your life. I don't know your heart. But i like to submit to you. There are many, many so-called Christians today who will say Jesus is their Lord, but they don't really obey Him. What do I mean? My wife and I were counseling this girl because she was very religious. She would always insist she has to go to this particular church. And wow, 
my wife and I were saying, that is so admirable. She is so faithful to her church. Except there's a problem. She does not mind living in with her boyfriend. She does not mind living in with somebody who is married. And that, my friend, is the problem of not knowing the Lord of our life, Jesus. He knows everything, and when He is Lord, we have to obey Him. No wonder, in Matthew chapter 10, Jesus tells us, Do not fear those who kill the body, but are unable to kill the soul, but fear Him who is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. He is now giving a comparison. He is saying, don't be afraid of men. Don't be afraid of their intimidation. Don't be afraid of what they can do to you. Just remember, set apart Christ. Give Him your highest respect. Give Him reverence. Fear Him who is able to destroy both soul and body. Do you realize who is Jesus? And that's why if you read the entire verses, he tells us that we must know who Jesus is. He is a good master. You know why? Instead of running away from him, the word fear him is to give him the highest respect. So friends, what are you afraid of? There is only one being that you should give him the highest respect, the highest adoration. Christ. He is a good Lord. I have asked people oftentimes, do you attend the worship service of CCF? They say yes. And I ask them, why? Well, praise God. Some people, they attend worship, they like the music. Good, but that's not good enough. Some people attend worship because they like the preaching. Praise God, but that's not good enough. The reason why you must pursue Jesus, you must follow God, is because of this simple answer. I worship, I follow because of who Jesus is. So when I worship on Sunday, my purpose is to have an encounter with Jesus to worship Him, to know Him. Why? Because of who Jesus is. You see, if you don't know who Jesus is, why will you love Him? Why will you pursue Him? Many times, our Christianity is very shallow. It's all feel good. You pursue Jesus. Why? Because of what He can do for you? That is never good enough. Peter is saying, you must be able to explain. You must be able to give an account. For the hope that is in you. Can you explain why you believe in Jesus? Yet with gentleness and reverence. Don't be proud, but explain this clearly. Why is this so important? Let me explain to you why putting Christ first, a Christ-centered life, is so crucial, provided you know why. Many years ago, there was a young man. He memorized the Bible. Do you know why he memorized the Bible? Because his Bible teacher would give him candy. And he loved candy. And because his memory was so good, he was able to memorize the four Gospels. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. Wow! This guy knew the Scriptures. And yet, when he grew older, he became an atheist. He is known as Nikita Khrushchev. This guy is the leader of the Communist Party after Stalin. He was more brutal in eradicating Christianity. He closed down churches. He imprisoned pastors. And yet this guy memorized scriptures. What's my lesson? What's your lesson? If you are attracted to the Bible, to Jesus for the wrong reason, then... He is not Lord, because you do not know that Jesus is Lord. Jesus is either Lord of all, or He is not Lord at all. The question is this, have you surrendered everything? Is Jesus really Lord of 
every area of your life. That is the bottom line. Sanctify Him as Lord in your heart. To overcome fear, you must have a clear conscience. What does it mean, clear conscience? Let's look at what the Apostle Peter has to say. Keep a good conscience so that in the thing in which you are slandered, those who revile your good behavior in Christ will be put to shame. It is in the present tense. Keep on maintaining a good conscience. Grammatically, it is like an imperative. It's like a command. Keep a good conscience. For what reason? If you have a good conscience before God, before men, your behavior will become exemplary. So that in the things in which you are slandered, those who revile your good behavior in Christ will be put to shame. Live your life in such a way, based on your conscience, so that you will bring glory to the Lord. For it is better, if God should will it, that you suffer for doing what is right, rather than for doing what is wrong. Can you now see the power of sanctifying Christ as Lord? If you and I live a Christ-centered life, then what's going to happen? You want to have a clear conscience. And if Christ is central, then your life, your action, will bring honor to the Lord. People often ask me, what do you mean by a good conscience? Well, let me first tell you, what is conscience? Conscience has to do with moral issues in the heart. Somebody once said, you can debate with your mind. You can argue with your mind what is right, what is wrong. However, you cannot debate with your conscience and win. Look at Romans chapter 2, verse 14. The Gentiles who do not have the law do instinctively the things of the law. This, not having the law, are a law to themselves. The Apostle Paul is saying the Gentiles who don't have the Bible, they don't have the Word of God, how do they behave? He's now telling them, even though they don't have the Ten Commandments, they don't have the law, notice the word, do instinctively the things of the law. What are those instincts? That they show the work of the law written in their hearts, their conscience bearing witness, and their thoughts alternately accusing or else defending them. In other words, conscience is that gift in your heart where what is right and wrong is written in your heart. All human beings all over the world have a sense of right and wrong. It is what I call the place where God's spirit and man's spirit connects. To tell you what you are doing is right or wrong. It has to do with moral issues. The Apostle Paul tells us the goal of our instruction is love from a pure heart and a good conscience. He's telling Timothy, when you disciple people, when you help somebody grow in Christ, you must know the objective. The objective is not knowledge. The objective is more than knowledge. The objective is love. Teach them how to love like Christ. But more than that, a good conscience and a sincere faith. In other words, whatever you do, when you teach people, when you disciple people, teach them the importance of a good conscience. The Bible tells us, keeping faith and a good conscience. You must maintain a good conscience, which some have rejected and suffered shipwreck in regard to their faith. You cannot neglect your conscience. Because to neglect your conscience is to experience spiritual shipwreck. There have been times when God convicts me from the heart. Let me give you an example. My wife, I don't even recall the specifics, but I recall there were times when my wife asked me some questions 
and I did not answer her straight. And can I tell you something? My conscience bothered me. And when my conscience bothers me, I know there's only one thing to do. I go to my wife and I tell my wife, Honey, I'm really sorry. This is really what I meant. This is really what happened. I'm reminded of the story of this girl, Fiona Campbell. Fiona Campbell was in the Guinness Book of Record for the first woman to walk across the planet Earth over 19,500 miles, almost 20,000 miles. It took her 11 years across five continents in 1994. She was able to receive the acclaim, the popularity she wanted, people recognize her. But guess what happened? Her conscience bothered her. Why? Because in the last part of her leg, probably in the 11th year, we don't exactly know when, she rode a truck for 1,000 miles. Why did she ride a truck? She was then pregnant. But you see, no amount of rationalization will suit her conscience. She called her sponsor. She called the Guinness Book of Records to remove her name. Why? Her conscience bothered her. I don't know about you. How are you living with your conscience? My prayer is you and I will have a clear conscience because a clear conscience will help you overcome fear. That is why we need the Word of God. What do I mean? We need the Spirit of God. Hebrews 9, 14 tells us, How much more will the blood of Christ who through the eternal spirit offered himself without blemish to God, cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. Our conscience has to be cleansed by the spirit of God, by the word of God. You know why? Conscience that is not balanced by the word of God and by the spirit of God can be dangerous. For some people, their conscience is way off. They are ultra sensitive. Like they are bothered. Example, eating of pork. According to the Bible, what God has cleansed, you can eat. If you eat it with gratitude. What is the other extreme? The other extreme is a dead conscience. A seared conscience. A conscience that is defiled. I remember years ago when kidnappers kidnapped my brother after hitting him in the head and blood all over the kidnappers told my brother after a long negotiation he was dropped somewhere in the expressway and the kidnappers told him here is some money for you to take a taxi our conscience tells us to give you some money. Can you imagine kidnappers claiming to have conscience? So, how do you have a good conscience? My advice, a good conscience means your conscience has to be calibrated by God's word, balance it with God's word, what God has to say, and God's spirit, purified. And the result is a clear conscience. You cannot just depend on conscience. It has to be calibrated by the objective Word of God. What does the Bible have to say? Just because your conscience tells you it's okay to sleep with a girl, just because your conscience tells you it's okay to commit adultery, does not make it right. You know why? You need to calibrate that with God's Word and God's Spirit. A clear conscience, remember, it is not perfection. However, it means when God's Spirit is bothering you in your heart, you need to post, confess your sins to the Lord, or confess what you have done to somebody and ask for forgiveness. That's the idea of having a clear conscience. You deal with it moment by moment, day by day. 
Live a Christ-centered life. Have a clear conscience. Confident in Christ. Place your confidence in Christ. Confident. What does it mean? You see, it's one thing to believe in Jesus. But do you have confidence? Do you really believe that He will keep His word? He will keep His promises? Let's look at what the Apostle Peter had to say about Jesus. From 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 18 up to verse 22, it has to do with the victory of Jesus. What do we mean? Christ died for sins once for all, the just for the unjust. This is the essence of the gospel. Confident in what Jesus did for us. Christ died for our sins. Notice, once for all. He does not have to die again. Jesus died once and for all. 2,000 years ago, He went to the cross and died for our sins. Once for all, the just for the unjust. The Bible tells us Jesus was without sin. He took your place. He took my place. That's what Christ did. What else happened? So that He might bring us to God having been put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the Spirit. The Bible says, when Jesus died on the cross for our sins, the just for the unjust, what was He able to accomplish? You and I can now be presented before God. God is holy. I cannot come before God. But because of what Jesus did, listen, He died on the cross for your sins, for my sins. Do you really understand what He did? So that you will have confidence in going before God. Why? Because all your sins have been paid for. Having been put to death in the flesh, Jesus died for us, made alive in the spirit, in which he went and made proclamation to the spirits now in prison. What does this mean? The Bible tells us sometime between Friday and Sunday, when Jesus died on the cross, his flesh, he died, but his spirit, what was Jesus doing? Between Friday and Sunday, the Bible tells us what was Jesus doing? He went and made proclamation to the spirits now in prison. The word proclamation is from the Greek word keruso. Keruso simply means an announcement, a declaration. It has to do with victory. That same word is used to describe a victorious general. And before the general will go to the city to have a parade, there is the Caruso, there is the proclamation. Before the emperor, before the king will come as a victor, there will be a Caruso, there will be an announcement. So the Bible tells us Jesus, in his spirit, went and made proclamation to the spirits now in prison. Who are these spirits now in prison? Well, let's find out. According to 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 20, these are men and women who once were disobedient when the patience of God kept waiting in the days of Noah during the construction of the ark. In other words, they did not listen to Noah because Noah warned them and God warned them they must repent and they are to build an ark for their safety. They refuse to listen. So that's one group of people being referred to. And when Jesus died, His Spirit went to these people to show them that Noah is correct. It's a declaration that they were all wrong by not listening to Noah. Another school of interpretation are as follows. These are spiritual beings. These are angelic beings. Remember, these are possible interpretation. It does not change the doctrines of the Bible. However, for curiosity, I just like to share this with you. If God did not spare angels when they sinned, but cast them into hell and committed them to pits of darkness reserved for judgment. 
and did not spare the ancient world, but preserved Noah, a preacher of righteousness, with seven others when he brought a flood upon the world of the ungodly. Notice, the Bible talks about God did not spare angels. Apparently, there are certain angels right now that is in prison. They are not free to roam around. Cast them into hell and committed them to pits of darkness. That's the allusion. In Jude 6, the Bible tells us angels who did not keep their own domain but abandoned their proper abode, he has kept in eternal bonds under darkness for the judgment of the great day. What the Bible is saying, there are angels today that are not, that are not free to roam. God in his sovereignty locked them up. Angels who did not keep their own domain, abandoned their proper abode, he has kept in eternal bonds under darkness for the day of the judgment of the great day. What God is saying, certain angels are so wicked, they did not follow the guidelines given, and God is saying they, were, they are now locked up. And who are these angels? Well, you will now get a hint when you read Genesis chapter 6, verse 1 to 4. It says, It came about when men began to multiply on the face of the land, daughters were born to them, that the sons of God saw that the daughters of men were beautiful. They took wives for themselves. That word sons of God can refer to angels. What do I mean? Job 1 verse 6. Now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan also came among them. This is referring to angels, sons of God. Now you begin to connect the two. It says in Genesis chapter 6, verse 4, The Nephilim were on the earth in those days, and also afterward when the sons of God came in to the daughters of men, and they bore children to them. Those were the mighty men who were of old men of renown. The word Nephilim comes from the Hebrew word fallen. Fallen angels. These are giants. Is that possible? Maybe. The point is this. God is sovereign. And Jesus was the complete victor. Jesus' victory over all powers, including angels. And Jesus went to make an announcement that he is the victor. And notice the emphasis. Corresponding to that, baptism now saves you, not with the removal of dirt from the flesh, but an appeal to God for a good conscience through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who is at the right hand of God, having gone into heaven, after angels and authorities and powers had been subjected to him. Jesus is a picture of a victor, the triumphant Jesus. He died for our sins. He rose again and salvation is sure. Notice the word corresponding to that. What does that mean? Baptism now saves you. Notice the word immersion. The word baptism means immerse. And he's saying, not the removal of dirt from the flesh. It's not talking about the literal aspect of water baptism. He's talking about it's a picture. It's a metaphor. It's a picture of how God saved Noah when he entered the ark. And so how God will save us today. Because Jesus is like the ark. When you are in Christ, you are protected from the coming judgment. And that's what 1 Peter is talking about. You can have confidence in Jesus because he's the complete victor. Through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who is at the right hand of God, having gone into heaven after angels and authorities and powers had been subjected to him. Do you notice the emphasis? The emphasis is not Christ just dying on the cross for our sins. 
but also the His resurrection. But the emphasis is not only through His resurrection. The emphasis is who is now at the right hand of God, having gone into heaven after angels and, and authorities and powers had been subjected to Him. Here is a picture of the complete victory of Jesus, the triumphant Christ. You can have confidence in Jesus because of who He is, what is accomplished, and His complete victory. So baptism is a picture of dying to our old life and being raised up, newness of life. So that's the picture of what Peter wants you to know. What Christ did for us, He took the judgment, He took the punishment for us, and when He rose again, we're given new life. Christ-centered life, a clear conscience, how will that help you overcome fear? It's one thing to know about Christ, to know about God, but do you have confidence in Him? Do you believe what He says will come true? The example given was Noah. What do I mean by Noah as an example of somebody who has faith, who has confidence in God? Let's find out. The Bible tells us the earth was corrupt in the sight of God and the earth was filled with violence. God looked on the earth and behold, it was corrupt for all flesh had corrupted their way upon the earth. Here is a picture of what happened in the time of Noah. The Bible tells us the earth was filled with violence. Sounds like today. Corrupt. The end of all flesh has come before me, for the earth is filled with violence because of them. And behold, I am about to destroy them with the earth. God gave Noah the most sobering announcement. God tells Noah, the earth is filled with violence, it's corrupt. I am going to destroy the whole earth. Here you can see the holiness of God. You can see the sovereignty of God. Nobody could stop God. Nobody is telling God what to do. God is saying, on my own, I am making a judgment. I am going to destroy the entire earth. When God wants something done, nobody can contradict Him. And nobody can stop Him. But He gave Noah a warning. What is that warning? Noah, I want you to do something. Make for yourself an ark of gopher wood, and you shall make the ark with rooms, and shall cover it with inside and outside the pitch. God gave Noah the exact dimensions on how to build the ark. And what did Noah do? Look at Hebrews 11 verse 7. By faith, by faith Noah being warned by God about things not yet seen, in reverence, prepared an ark for the salvation of his household by which he condemned the world and became an heir of the righteousness which is according to faith. The Bible tells us what Noah did. When God warned Noah, what did Noah do? By faith, being warned by God about things not yet seen, what God told Noah has no precedent. There has been no rain yet. If you read the book of Genesis, there was no rain. Noah had no idea. What does it mean there will be a flood? Noah had no idea. What is the meaning of an ocean? What is the sea? There was no precedent. But Noah simply believed. And because he believed, he acted. The Bible tells us, warned by God about things not yet seen, reverence, that's the word for godly fear, godly respect, prepared an ark for the salvation of his household by which he condemned the world. I want you to notice why the Bible used Noah as an example. Because Noah is a man who went against the culture of his day. Can you imagine Noah preaching righteousness, telling people to repent and telling them to build an ark? against the entire culture, against the value system, I won't be surprised. 
if they were laughing at Noah. Can you imagine? It is one thing to be faithful, to follow God for one week, two weeks, one year, not Noah. Noah invested everything, his entire energy, to do what God wanted him to do. 100 years of faithful obedience, building the ark, preaching, even though he has no idea what it means to have a flood. That's faith, confidence in God's word, in God's promises, and above all, in God's character. God promised to save Noah. And by the grace of God, I can guarantee you, Noah has no regret. When you give your life and place your confidence in God, in Christ, you will have no regrets. At the end of your life, you will know it is worth it. That is the example of Noah. I realize today it is similar. People may laugh at you. People may say, are you a Christian? You're crazy. Do what you like to do. Why follow the Bible? You see, the Bible tells us to overcome the fear of men, to overcome the fear of being ridiculed, you must be Christ-centered, live a life with a clear conscience, and place your confidence in God. Because you believe in God's warning, you believe in God's promises, and you don't have to be afraid of men. You live for the audience of one. You know, surprisingly, the flood is a worldwide event. It did happen historically, geographically, archaeologically speaking. I wanted to study the reality of that judgment. You read that in the Babylonian epic, in different cultures, even in Palawan. The natives have story of the flood. What's my point? My point is this. Are you living a Christ-centered life with a clear conscience and your confidence is in God's word, God's promises. In Matthew 24, verses 37 to 39, the Bible tells us, As the coming of the Son of Man will be, just like the days of Noah. What does it mean? Until the day that Noah entered the ark, they did not understand until the flood came and took them all away. So will the coming of the Son of Man be. The Bible tells us one day Jesus will come again. And when Jesus will come again, the Bible is very clear, it is not water that will destroy this world. The Bible tells us in 2 Peter, it's going to be fire. Fire coming down from heaven. Judgment will surely happen. But when did judgment happen? The Bible is very clear. Until the day that Noah entered the ark. Friends, judgment is coming. Question, are you inside the ark? Are you in Christ or are you not? Today, the ark of God is open. Anybody can come to Jesus. It's open. But the day will come when it will be too late to come to the ark of God. Jesus is our ark. When you are in Jesus, you are saved from the judgment to come. Question, will you have the courage to explain to the people the good news? Will you have the courage? As 1 Peter chapter 3 tells us, can you explain to the people why you believe what you believe? We are given the greatest opportunity today. In light of the pandemic, in light of what's happening, we are to live a life that is going to tell people the reality of the coming of Jesus. The Bible tells us you don't have to be afraid. In fact, Titus chapter 2 tells us looking for the blessed hope and the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior Jesus Christ. Our greatest hope, our hope, our blessed hope is the coming again of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. He is called the glory of our great God and Savior, Christ Jesus. 
complete victory. And that, my friend, is what God has promised to you and to me. If it's your desire to make sure that you can have this living hope based on the promise of Jesus to protect us from the judgment to come, I want you to pray with me. If God has spoken to you and you are not even sure you are in Jesus, you are not yet in the ark that God has provided, Jesus is the ark of our salvation. Are you in Jesus? He's asking you today and I'm asking you today. Can you be sure that you are in Jesus? So that when he comes again, it's going to be a glorious day. It'll be a glorious day of seeing Jesus. And you don't have to live in fear or be afraid. I'm going to give you a chance to pray, to surrender your life, to repent, and to come to Jesus. Let's pray. Father God in heaven, thank you for reminding us, thank you for reminding me that the day of judgment is coming. Thank you for reminding us not to be afraid of people, not to be afraid of circumstances, not to be afraid of what people can do to us. But Lord, we are to sanctify you. We are to live a Christ-centered life. You are to be centered in our life. And most important, we should place our confidence in you. So Lord Jesus, I now pray for those who are not yet sure. You are not central. Will you speak to them? Please pray this prayer with me. Lord Jesus, I invite you into my heart. I want you to be central. I want you to be the center of my life. I want you to be my Savior. So Jesus, I will trust you. I will entrust to you the salvation of my life and my family by committing my life to you. Thank you, Jesus, for dying on the cross, for taking the judgment for my sins. And now I come to you. Be my Lord. Be my Savior. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We are now entering in our celebration of the Lord's table. When we take the supper, we do so in remembrance of Christ's death. The Lord's Supper calls us to look back and remember, calls us to reconnect and remind ourselves of the work of Jesus Christ on the cross for our redemption, meaning the payment that he made for the penalty of our sins. When we take the Lord's Supper, we must never forget what we are remembering. The just one, Jesus Christ, dying for the unjust ones, that's you and I, that he might bring us into the safe presence of God. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 18 says, For Christ died for sins once for all, the righteous for the unrighteous, to bring you to God. Jesus Christ suffered for us. He endured the cross and he died to take away our sins. He died once for all. Sometimes we may feel like we need to be forgiven all over again. But Christ's atonement has been made once for all with no need to ever be repeated again. The sinless one died for the sinners. The righteous one died for the unrighteous, the just for the unjust, the holy for the unholy. He substituted himself for us. And for what purpose? Why did he do that? Just what the verse says, to bring you to God. <laughs> what does that mean? It means Jesus gave his life and sacrificed himself for us so that we can be reconciled to God, so that we can have a relationship with the Father, so that we can have an access to the Father, so that we can approach 
the throne of grace with confidence. He gave up his life so that we can be purified from sin so we can approach God. With that as a reminder, and before we distribute the elements of communion, let's pause for a moment and think and meditate for a moment that verse again, 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 18, For Christ died for our sins once for all, the righteous for the unrighteous, to bring you to God. Now while you're meditating, personalize it to imagine your sins, your unrighteousness, and your reconciliation with God. So let's have a moment of silence. And then we'll distribute the elements and we'll pray. Let us pray. Father God, as we hold this bread in our hands, we look back and remember at how Jesus' body was broken for our transgressions. We thank you, Lord, for your Son who gave up his body so we may be in the body of Christ and be counted worthy of his sacrifice on the cross. And as our lips touch the cup, we look back and remember his shed blood for us. He suffered and he died so that we may live. Thank you, Lord, for your Son who willingly shed his blood that the sin debt was paid in full and for all who will just believe. In your Son's great name, Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, we pray. Amen. For I receive from the Lord what I also pass on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, he took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it, and he said, Take this, spot, take this and eat it. This is my body, which is for you. And do this in remembrance of me. Let's all partake of the bread together. In the same way, after supper, you all took the cup, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Let's all partake of the cup together. And all of God's people said, Amen, Amen, and Amen. In any pain, grief, and suffering, our hope is alive in you because we know that you are with us. You will never leave us nor forsake us. Standing on this mountain top, looking just how far we've come, knowing that for every step you were with us. Kneeling on this battleground, seeing just how much you You feel like you're losing hope. Is it a struggle to stay hopeful? But God wants to comfort you today from His Word to your heart. Allow me to read from 1 Peter chapter 4, starting from verse 12. He said, the first words is this, Beloved, God loves you. 
But he continues to say this, share the sufferings of Christ. Keep on rejoicing. How can I rejoice in the midst of suffering? Here's the answer, verse 19. Therefore, let us let those also suffer according to the will of God and trust their souls to a faithful creator in doing what is right. That will be our prayer for today. Lord God, help us to do what is right. Help us, oh God, to entrust our lives, our very souls to you, oh God, suffering according to your will. Oh God, I pray that all my brothers and my sisters will remain hopeful because you are faithful, oh God. You love us unconditionally. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. everyone for joining us today if you have been encouraged or blessed by this online service would you let us know about it if you need more information about us just connect with us through the different platforms you see on the screen as we end this online service and if you want to join a small group online can you let us know we are always encouraged to know that God is using this ministry to touch lives across the world through what He is doing here in San Francisco, California. So if that is you, and you have a story to share, or if you have made that step to follow Christ today, please let us know. We want to partner with you as you grow in your relationship with Jesus. We are one body, and we are excited to connect with you. By the way, just to help us all process the things we have seen and heard this morning, we have some discussion questions for you on the screen later. You can use those questions when you gather with your friends and families or use it on your own personal quiet time with God. Also, if you would like to worship through your giving, you can do so by giving securely online and help us bring the love of Jesus and our ministries like this to people wherever they may be. Lastly, every Sunday, our children's church happens at 12.30 p.m. for kids 3 to 7 years old 
and at 2 p.m. for kids ages 8 to 12. Just call the number on your screen and we would be glad to give you the link. So that's it. We'd love to see you again next week and on behalf of CCF here in the Bay Area, my name is Nisha Dale again saying love and blessings to all of you. Have a wonderful week ahead.